Welcome everyone, I'm Kathy Brown of Brown Nose Social Media and it's time for another edition of What's News in Healthcare Social Media. I am with today's guest, Jason Seiden. Jason, would you like to say hello? Hello. <laughs> Thanks and for having me, Kathy. Thank you. And Jason is the founder and CEO of Ajax Workforce Marketing. He also has some other interesting blogs. Google his name and you'll find a lot about him. I'm not going to take a lot of time today. <laughs> about himself on our event page and uh, there are some interesting posts that he has out there so we're going to get started right away um, I did just return from India I'm not going to take this show's time to talk about it maybe we'll get into it later when some of our viewers join us at the bottom of the hour but I am so ready to talk about some of the articles and I want to thank first Todd Hartley and Scott Scowcroft for covering me last week on what's news in healthcare social media I watched it loved it I learned something new so thank you you both of you it was spectacular so are you ready to get started Jason I am what do you got well let's start with the article that we had on the social media checkup sure um, healthcare industry growing stronger because I don't want to talk a, a long time about this but I think it's important to recognize why healthcare is continuing to push into the social realm despite the fact that they've got white knuckles holding them back and saying no we can't we can't be public um, and what this article really talks about, some of the, the key points. Um, there are three main reasons that healthcare is moving into the social realm, according to this article. One, regulators are starting to give some boundaries. So with boundaries, we have a little bit more freedom to step forward, although some of those boundaries recently have been very strange, especially in the pharmaceutical area. Um, patients are demanding it, number one reason in my book. Patients want the social activity on on the digital space to be able to reach their doctors, their hospitals, and to be able to be known and heard. Mm -hmm. Lastly, digital information can improve patient care, and I think we're just starting to see that. Um, have you have you paid attention to the the whole trend of healthcare getting into the social realm, Jason? Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, the the healthcare's path into social mirrors uh, the financial services path into social, which uh, I've been watching and been a, a part of for years. Uh, what's what's really interesting to me are a couple things, right? If we look at if we look at patients, I think you're exactly right. Patients will drive this, and no matter what a company wants to do or how they want to hide, the fact is is that a patient on social media can actually get to the people that they want to connect with. So mm -hmm. as a company, you're kind of stuck, right? If your patients are are actually messaging your directors and vice presidents and doctors and and sales reps directly, you you kind of have to deal with it. Uh, the other interesting thing is I think regulations, a, it's a red herring. Regulations, um, so here's how this played out in, in, uh, in the financial sector. Um, it's a red herring because it looks like a social media thing, but really it's a cultural thing. Right? You've got an industry that is used to dealing from a position of fear. It's used to hiding behind very, very strict and clear regulations. Along comes social. Social media is moving faster than regulatory bodies can keep up. So all of a sudden, the regulations get a little fuzzy. They get a little more, uh, you know, prescriptive as a, as opposed to proscriptive. Like, hey, use your best judgment in these cases, as opposed to like, here's the hard and fast rule. But you've got organizations that don't have cultures that can adapt to that, even that little bit of ambiguity. So when you have a company that starts hiding behind regulation as the reason why it's not on social that has nothing to do with, with social media. That just has to do with the fact that you've got a fear-based culture in that organization. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be patient-driven. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, and it's exciting to watch. It's going to be lumpy, but it's, it's going to be a fun ride. Well, I love the fact that you pointed out about the culture because um, I see that so much that there are people that recognize the strength of social participation and they want to get information out to patients. They want to drive patients to their practice to um, give them information that can arm them to make the right decisions to stay healthy and and it just can't be done as long as the decision makers are reluctant to do that and it really is a cultural thing and I wish I wish that I could have a whole hangout discussion on <laughs> not, not with me as the expert but with others as the expert to give tips on how to change that culture because it's so important so you know I'll, I'll just say this and I know we've got we've got other articles to go through uh, when 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 I'm working with with clients, when Ajax is working with clients, part of our work is actually social media therapy for executives, 
because very frequently we find organizations want to delegate social responsibility to a mid-level manager and say, just let's go get our, let's go get content sharing out there, let's go get Google Plus and LinkedIn and all this stuff out there. And what they don't realize is digital natives may understand the technology better, but it's still executives who drive the behavioral norms for the organization. So if your executives are not on social, then no matter how comfortable digital natives are using Facebook or LinkedIn, they're not ever going to do it because they're going to follow your executives' leads. So it's really important uh, if you know somebody who's listening to this is wondering what's best in class for getting our organization up and running on, on social, even just from a marketing standpoint, part of the answer is get that social media therapy for your executives, get them comfortable, get the language happening. That unlocks a lot of downstream behaviors. That's really good advice because just taking baby steps, letting the the decision makers take those baby steps and to get comfortable and know that there's a boundary that they're comfortable with is a really good starting point. And then you can always expand those boundaries as the comfort level expands as well. Well there's one there's one other thing I want to really point out about this article that was interesting to me. Now the article talks about um, some various areas of healthcare where social media is particularly useful and one of the areas where they said it's growing is with insurers who are being contacted or interacting with patients who are giving their feedback on services they received. Um, I'm assuming that a lot of those are probably negative experiences. What? You think? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's not very often that somebody goes out there and says, oh, I just had this wonderful doctor fix me up with my cold. You know, they, sure. they don't think about that. But when they go and they think they should get fixed and they go home and all they got was, you know, go home and take something over the counter and wait for it to, to um you know, wait it out, that's really not the answer they want, so they sometimes want to voice an opinion that's negative. My point here is if insurers are listening to patients, yeah. patients are talking about the, the, the services they received, then healthcare providers have to be out there trying to build a reputation that encourages people to say positive as opposed to negative things, and that they will respond to those negative things promptly and correctly so that you can maintain your brand as a professional in the healthcare industry and keep that reputation top of the list. So I want to I want to echo that and this is going to be a little self-serving. Uh, you know when when we started when we started Ajax we started like everybody else just doing social training and social marketing. We have come to the conclusion that getting your employees engaged is critically important and I'll tell you why. Most people who do go online are going to complain, right? That's just the nature of the beast. The natural gut reaction of most organizations is to do two things. Number one, to sell harder, right? To crank up the the, the corporate marketing machine and just push uh, propaganda out there. And it doesn't work, right? In, in a social environment, it doesn't work. It, people can see through it for what it is. The second thing that companies very naturally gravitate toward doing is arguing with, with people, right? And having the the, uh, the approved social marketing manager go out and say, we're sorry that we, you had this experience, this is really what we're about, that wasn't represented. And that doesn't work either, it, it's disingenuous. It's really important that companies get out into social and understand that this is a conversational medium, it's not a broadcast media, it's not simply a, a feedback channel, it's an ongoing dialogue that you have with the market. So you need as many people in your organization out there having conversations as possible. You, the best way to combat that negative experience is to have consumers in their minds say, okay, I don't like this experience. I want to go blast the company. But you know what? Jim, who I was dealing with, is a friend, is a good person, really did what they could. And so either they stop themselves from typing or they end up typing something that's you know, while Jim and customer service was trying to take care of me, I really didn't like this policy. And all of a sudden, you have a more balanced conversation, and that's something that healthcare providers and insurers, everybody up and down the chain, can deal with proactively. So I think your your point is exactly right, and I just want to encourage organizations as they start to deal with this, take a page out of other industries who have been here. Uh, Dell started their social media journey the same way with people complaining about right and they just they got their butts whooped and they started having a conversation and now they they actually train and uh, they have a whole ambassador program for their employees financial services same thing healthcare it's your turn 
don't overlook the power of, of, uh, of conversation. Uh, I'd like to uh, chime in here. There are a couple of comments that I think are worthy of mentioning that are out on the event page by our viewers. Janet Kennedy says, 85% of online viewers about docs are positive. In many cases, especially on Yelp, the negative comments are about non-medical issues, the decor, greetings by the front desk, etc. So I think that's important to realize that it's really not the service that you end up getting the negative comments on in a lot of cases. And if it's, it's not... plastic chairs, right? <laughs> yeah, that's an easy fix. Um, Janine Bevan also says, I've been talking with my insurer, self-funded employee plan about pricing as I look for an, an endodontist who are amazing in the range of pricing for the same service. Price shopping for a service is important, especially when you have yearly caps and dental insurance. Um, mm -hmm. so those are all topics that can be conversations out there that yeah. can affect the positive and negative response of patients that I think are easy and safe to, to address. Well, let's move on to the next article. Sure. Five effective healthcare marketing strategies you've never tried. Well, can I don't we, think you can we, never can tried. That's kind of presumptuous, don't you think? I, top five, top ten, like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> right. Okay, so we're, we're, we're going to set out to, to disprove this article. So if we're talking about these points and any of you have tried these, I want you to post on the event page and stake your claim that you have indeed tried these. So are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. Number one, surveys. Using surveys to survey your customers, your patients. Um, I would say that that would be a great way to really learn about your local lifestyle of your patients and any other insights you, you would want to use. How would you use surveys, Jason? Uh, you know, so to, I would actually divide this into a big and a small. Um, I, I've got a, a woman at Ajax, her name is Lisa Cervenka, she's our head of marketing, she is fantastic and she's got this phrase that I've adopted that people love their smalls. Uh, you know, so from a survey standpoint, being able to do a quick poll, how do you feel about X? What would, you know, would you like to see A or B, right? And then showing people the results right away, it's a, it's a nice easy way to get engagement and over time if you run those kinds of polls, not only do you get some idea of how people shake out on specific issues, but based on which issues people actually respond to, right? Like one survey might get 15 results, another one might get 1,500 results, you start to learn what's important to people. And like the comment said before, it may be the decor in the waiting room is really, you know, it, that's what people want to want to know about. So using a really small light touch, uh, either an actual poll on a website or even just a, a Twitter question that goes out to a group of, of local folks or you know, in my hometown, there's a group that um, uh, it, it's, it's quasi, you know, it's run by people who have an official capacity in the hometown, even though this particular Facebook uh, page is not official, and they run these kinds of things all the time. Uh, so that's a great way to use social, uh, you know, on a small basis. Create a little community, throw some stuff out there, see what comes back, r rinse, repeat. The big is actually to go a little bit deeper, and it's not to do a, a poll or a survey per se, but it's just to take the time to look at what people are saying. Uh, you know, go through the rating sites, go through Yelp, go through, you know, look at the comments on, on whether it's a doctor's page or it's an insured page, wherever, to see what people are saying, and keep a spreadsheet where you're keeping your own tally on what are the topics people are mentioning, and is it positive or negative. Uh, years ago, I used to do this in call centers. I would literally, as a consultant, I would sit, listen to calls, and I would just score them. What topics are being addressed? Is it a positive, negative tone? And when you do that over time, it's amazing what kind of insights you're able to glean uh, that just oftentimes run counter to your intuition. Okay, well, let's keep going. Yep. Sorry, <laughs> big answer, but it was, you know, it was a, all right, I'll keep okay. the next one short. Number two is a chance to win. In other words, having some kind of a contest where people either retweet, skip they it. repair, skip they like. It. You know what, just it, skip it. It's you know, know. keeping your brand, it, forget it. I, I never do those things. Now, I think everybody has tried that. I don't think that that's a new thing at all. So um, anybody who wants to take claim at least that you've done number two, let me know. Number three, share preventative tips. Well, duh, in healthcare, that seems like a pretty obvious one as well. Let's get to number four, however. Announce open appointment dates. Um, if you have a spot in, and you've got a sudden cancellation, using something like Twitter to... Love it. 
announce that. You know, let's say I have a kid. If, if I have a kid who I'm not really sure I want to take him, his sore throat's not that bad yet, and I really do need to get to work, and if I try to get an appointment, I'm probably going to have to stay home half the day, and all of a sudden, boom, there's an appointment, and I have time to drive across town, pick up my son, and get to the appointment. I'm going to seize that opportunity and fill that slot. How many of you have used social media to announce open spots? Well, even even better. You now have a reason to actually ask somebody for a, uh, for a Twitter handle, Right, put your list together so that when that slot opens up, you're not just blasting it, but you can use Hootsuite or a content sharing platform and specifically target people on your list who have active appointments. Right, so you train people to actually engage with you on this medium. It's it's a fantastic uh, tip. I do want to say though that if you're going to give specific patients notices about the openings because of HIPAA compliance, you do want to do that in a private direct message. So that's very important that you keep that in mind if you're going to be specifically talking with patients. Okay, number five, cross-promote, as in cross-promote as in um, going with someone else in the community and saying, I'm going to help you spread your word and you're going to help me spread my word and we're going to do things together and, and um, give each other extra exposure. How many of you actually have, I don't want to say formal, but somewhat formal relationships with other entities in your community or in your industry where you cross-promote? And this is the wonderful thing about social is it just makes it light. It does, this doesn't even have to be a formal campaign. It could be my friend across town is doing X, Y, and Z. It's, it's so nice, so light. Definitely. Okay, so um, I think we've covered that topic all. And when we talk about new approaches, I wanted to, to offer my own fresh approach. Um, and that is if you haven't already considered doing this, Consider having an internal contest where you ask the employees to submit interesting, funny puns, jokes, things that are just lighthearted and fun because those are the things that often get shared. It doesn't have to be um, serious healthcare stuff all the time. People like to be entertained and a good laugh is healthy. So if you have these contests in your, in your environment and you award maybe for the funniest, the punniest, um, the cleverest, whatever those top things are, and you, you give people recognition for that, you still can take every one of those submissions and use them as, as the, the posts that you use throughout the year, and you can even time them in Hootsuite or somewhere else and use them as little salt and pepper tidbit laughs in between your serious posts. I, you know, I, mean, I know we're going we're gonna to talk about Pinterest in a couple minutes, but can you imagine a board of, you know, here's our smiles. You have a dentist's office. Right, best smile I've seen today, or you know, an orthopedic looking at you know, just weirdest, weirdest broken finger or something like that. There's so many things that you can do that are small and easy to do that humanize your office, that give people a, a you know a connection to you. I, that, what a great idea, Kathy. Okay, the next article is about the ice bucket challenge, and I don't think we need to pull this apart too much, but I think it's important to talk about why this campaign was so successful. It has been everywhere. Have you seen it? Uh, yeah, I've I've uh, decided to. So ALS is one of the causes that my family gives to. Uh, my wife lost her her uh, grandmother to ALS, so we've been involved for years. Uh, and uh, but I've decided I have my sisters live in Texas and California that have these incredible droughts. So we just we focused on the financial giving, and I've been conserving the water. But uh, that was my decision. It's been an unbelievable success in terms of generating awareness, uh, generating donations. It's been it's been wild to watch. Well, and I think we should talk about why it is so so wild. I I also have had an aunt that passed from ALS, so I think that ALS touches people in some way, maybe third or fourth friends or, or however that is. But ALS is not uncommon, and to have something like this that is relatively safe to do. I have to say I am not doing the bucket challenge. I much prefer the hundred dollars over the ten dollars. Right. <laughs> so the ice is not happening. I don't even get in a cold pool. But um, <laughs> let's talk about why this campaign is so successful. How have they managed to keep it on track with ALS versus I'm gonna have fun dumping ice on me or my friend? So you, I'm gonna be a little bit of a contrarian uh, and I'm gonna say you don't control this kind of stuff. The, you, the I don't think if somebody came to me and said, we want an ice bucket challenge to work, what I would tell them is we're going to come up with 15 or 20 different ideas and we're going to space them out, we're going to run them all, maybe one will hit. 
because uh, you can't you can't dictate this. I mean, one of the most amazing things about the Ice Bucket Challenge is that the branding stayed so consistent from start to end. It's you know, you watch these videos and everybody starts with their opening and it's the hundred hours of the ice and I'm going to do both right and it, and it, there's just this incredible consistency. There's really nothing the organization is going to do to uh, you know, to be able to sustain that once it 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 goes viral. That either happens or it doesn't. So. There's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, uh, serendipitous thing that's happened here. Uh, I think you really do, you, when you start it, you have to stay true to your core. There has to be a tie, some kind of tie back to who you are and what you, and what you stand for. The, one of the remarkable things about the Ice Bucket Challenge is that there really is no con direct connection between dumping ice over your head and ALS, and yet it still was able to maintain its branding nonetheless. Uh, so you know, if you want to try and emulate it, Stay true, try to keep a connection, and let it go, right? Let people run with it. And if it goes in a different direction, don't freak out. Get them next time. Well, Janine Bevan made a good point here on the event page. She said that the it's it's a very small goal. The ten dollars is a very doable challenge, and it's something that you can invite your friends to be a part of. And it's great for photo ops. And she's right. All of those things make for a great social campaign, and um, that's just wonderful as far as getting people to participate. I also think it's important to note that when when it was initially launched, it was launched in a very specific list of what was expected that you would you would um, challenge someone else that you would state what it was for and go from there. Um, how hard is that to get people to really fall in line with the instructions of how to do something? Uh, it's hard. I mean, it, it's hard, right? It's, we, can, we can sit here and say, look, here, are the, we can dissect it in hindsight. Putting it together proactively is an entirely different story. So we can go in hindsight and say, look, it's a, it's a small ask, it's a photo op, people get to see themselves, they get to share it with friends. All of these things are true. It's, you can put together a campaign that has all those parts that doesn't work. So I would say definitely stick to those parts, but, but don't have the expectations that you're going to have this kind of success. Just do this regularly and keep trying. You know what, Kathy, the thing that you were talking about a minute ago, the internal campaign uh, to get employees to actually share uh, stories or photos of themselves, that's a great way to start to see if you can get something like the Ice Bucket Challenge to have legs. If you can get it to work internally or with a, with a small group of clients or friends or local folks, that's a good clue that you may have something that'll work at a larger scale. Good points. Well, let's move on to the article. We're running out of time here, and I don't want to miss some of these good ones. We have uh, seven Pinterest marketing tips to improve your visibility. And I know that off camera, you mentioned to me that you were surprised that I was bringing up a Pinterest article. But I thought there were some really good things about this article. And, and the reason I think that Pinterest should not be ignored is that we know there is a very specific demographic that populates Pinterest. Mm -hmm. And if your market is the patient who who frequents Pinterest, then you want to at least get their initial attention and then drive them to your website, which Pinterest does beautifully once people click on a picture that resides on your website. So of all these, what was your favorite, Jason? Of how to use Pinterest? Uh, so I tend to like uh, I tend to like things like we were talking about that draw people in. I like uh, uh, photo campaigns that uh, make you a hub. So it sounds counterintuitive, but one of the tips was was look across the industry and right, make competitors' uh, images part of your board. And I actually, I think that's great. You know, some of the most effective social media campaigns I've seen are when people say, I'm going to do a roundup of what's happening and what's interesting. And you get known as the person who's not just going to sell your own stuff, but who's actually going to bring everything together. So if you can use Pinterest to do that, hook them in that way, uh, you know, I think, I think that would be a great way to get at this demographic and then funnel them through to where you want them to go. Well, one, of the, one of the points that I thought was interesting was the fact that they pointed out that people who are on Pinterest are often shopping, and that is true. And you don't think about it in healthcare, but there are a lot of things that health systems would like to promote that are that are optional procedures, that are elective procedures that they would like to drive people to consider. I'm not suggesting that you post the exact pricing, although healthcare is being driven to 
be more transparent about pricing. But even to do a price range that somehow gives people an idea that it's not as expensive as you think for the reward. And showing a picture of a before and after of whatever that elective surgery or elective procedure is. Maybe it's a change in how you live. Maybe it's a change in how you look. And then showing that that it's like it's like the hotel ratings, a five star, four star, three star, you know, maybe it's right. a, I don't know how you do that, but there's gotta be a way to tap into that. Uh, be careful, right? This this gets inappropriate really fast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I agree, but there's 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 a lot of potential here. Yes. Um, another one of the points that I liked about this article was the fact that there's a way to use Pinterest to allow people to pin your Google Plus posts to go back to them later. I I don't know about you, Jason, but there have been so many great posts that I would see as I'm. I'm getting ready to do something else and it shows up in my notifications and it's an absolutely great post and I start to read it but I don't have time and I want to go back to it and then boom it's gone. There's there's no save, there's no mark is unread, there's they took that away in the right. early days of Google Plus. And to have a way to go back to it and save it, yes I know there's a favorites feature if you have that plugin installed, but there but it doesn't work on phone. Right. Right. No, look and and anything you can do to kind of save something so you can go back for later. Is is huge. I mean, we all have those little those little tricks, those little life hacks that we use to to do that. Uh, it's it's a great use of uh, it's a great hack of Pinterest. Uh, you know, personally, like look, I, what hooks me in, I just like the photos of people. Like, I like the idea that I might see myself on a board. I like the idea that I might see my friends on a board. So the idea of going to uh, uh, I'm, I, for me personally, I'm less interested in, in saving things, and I'm more interested in going to a, to a board uh, to go get some some light information, and then just getting sucked into uh, to something that matters, you know, through it as a funnel. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to skip the others um, except for the one of the last ones, and that is creating a blog board. I did that with my Hangouts on Air because when I discovered that you can post videos on Pinterest, I started taking advantage of that, and I right. think this is a great opportunity for um, hospitals or for practices to take and and categorize some of the services or some of the common issues or, or illnesses that they see and to make boards based on that and have those boards contain the artwork that links back to the posts on their website. So, it, which by the way is another example of what we were talking about before, right? It's a collection of information. So if you've got tips and tricks and you've got before and after and you've got uh, pre and post op information, right, to have it categorized by issue that's how your that's how your audience is probably thinking about this stuff. That's a phenomenal way to kind of to create a cluster of information, be known as a source, right? And to create that funnel that can then, through social, you you draw them into a, a deeper relationship. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have pricing information in there. Yeah, there were a couple of links that I encourage people to go to that article and look for it. I provided all the articles on the event page. It's also on my website, um, but. When you get to that article, there are two links. One is um, Pin Groupie, which gives you a way to identify um, Pinterest groups that you might want to be a part of, and the other one is Pin Alerts that tells you when someone else has had a pin, a repin. And I think that's important. They talk about um, monitoring your competition and knowing who's pinning your competition and friending them or following them so that they want to start pinning your information as well. You just It's kind of a, hey, I'm out here too sort of thing. Um, it's worth taking a look at. We're not going to talk about it now. There's one last thing I want to move into. As I do that, I'm going to share the link for Inside the Hangout because at the bottom of the hour, I invite viewers to come in and join the conversation, to ask questions, to make their own comments. So if you haven't seen that link, uh, refresh your screen there on the event page. I have just shared that link and I encourage you to come in. Just make sure you're not playing the video when you do because if you do, we'll have an echo and all kinds of noise. So the last article. I'm going to skip down past the five guidelines and all that. I'm going to go straight to one that I kind of added in the last minute, and it was CFO Exchange, Healthcare Leaders Share Five Innovative Ideas. Now, this is not really a marketing article at all. This is um, talking about people who are brainstorming about ways to be more efficient in healthcare. This is your typical administrative, um, executive discussion on what are we going to do to be able to offer healthcare the way it needs to be offered and still afford to stay afloat. Mm -hmm. However, what's interesting about this article is as you start to read it and you read what's important to these people and what they're looking at, I want to encourage marketers to think about how social tools might play into this 
to help your administrators accomplish the things they need to accomplish as far as your overall organizational goals. For example, um, how can social interactions change patient behavior to use the ER less? They talked about how people are using the ER, ER and abusing it because it's there when they feel like it. They can do whatever they want to do during the day, especially if they're on a, a, a what do you call it, a supplemental plan or something where someone else is paying for it. They see common colds in the ER at two in the morning, mm -hmm. just because it's convenient for the people who are going in. So, how can you communicate better options to get people to go to the right places so that when you do have the ER for those those emergent visits, you're able to see them sooner and you can get better results. Another question you might ask yourself is how can social interactions communicate the efforts that your organization has as a whole? And in this case, they talk about one organization was really trying to be energy efficient. Well, if you're going to be energy efficient and you're going to be conscious about your environment, you're probably going to do a lot of recycling, some of which people are not familiar with. You're probably going to have some strange lights or um, I don't know what all those are. I know that when we started to go to the, the power saving lights, our lights wouldn't turn on right away. They kind of slowly turn on. Now they've gotten some technology better, but those are the little things that if I didn't know as a patient that this is why you have what you have in a, in a hospital, for example, I would think, what's the matter? They can't afford lights that really work? Or really, I'm here and I'm sick and you expect me to figure out which box is styrofoam versus plastic? So... <laughs> I, so, but can you let, let's connect a couple of dots here, right? Can you imagine a Pinterest board that has right? Should I go to the ER, right? Like, <clears throat> you know, and here's a picture of, you know, chest pains or head. Like, yes, get me to an ER, right? The sniffle, maybe not, right? Here's the t right. Here's the and and I know there's all kinds of there's all kinds of uh, uh, regulatory issues that that you absolutely have, but you, you don't want to you don't want people to uh, mistake a social conversation for advice, right? You want to give advice online, yes. So you know there are there are lines to be drawn, but you know you mentioned an ER. The ER is not only abused very often, but it's also a hospital. It's very often a hospital's marketing tool, right? That is most of the community's first and uh, primary interaction with a hospital. So connecting a specific Pinterest board or social media uh, outlet to it. And to be able to engage in some way, there's a lot of power uh, to doing that. So you know, I, I think the the key thing here is you know the next time next time the next time you as an organization are thinking, hey, there's a lot of information we have. Why don't we just push this out on our website? The answer may be, well, wait a second. Before we just push it out on our on our website, how do we actually create conversations around it that include both internal advocates as well as community members? where there's more fluid and ongoing dialogue. And then how do we use that dialogue to actually change the conversation that we're having you know, with people through a formal context? Well, and along the same line, one of the, the conversations I often have when organizations are becoming more social is, um, how are we supposed to deal with those conversations? We don't have the manpower to do it. And I want to point out that when you have good conversation content and you have an audience that is willing to participate, Sometimes your audience will continue that conversation for you. You don't have to be giving advice or uh, you, you don't have to be out there constantly. You just have to provide the venue and provide the topic. And many people, if they find that uh, useful, will continue to talk about it. And that conversation will grow and you'll get more exposure as they share it and bring other people into the conversation. That, that loops to the very first thing we talked about, that there's a cultural element to this. That mentality of how are we going to, you know, how we, how do we handle this? It's a control mentality. Conversations are not about control. It's about fluidity, and you have to be willing to handle a certain level of ambiguity to have them successfully. Yep. Well, we are at the bottom of the hour, and sometimes we have viewers come in and join us, and sometimes we don't. And I'm guessing that this is a busy week for everyone, so um, I'm not going to stretch this out any further. We do have some other articles that we could cover, but um, I think some of those are best to just be reviewed and um, looked at briefly. And take a look at what I have listed on the event page. I did also have a couple of, oh, by the ways, I'm going to add when we, we cut down. So I'm going to wrap it up today. And this is the end of this edition of What's News in Healthcare Social Media with me, Kathy Brown of Brown Nose Social Media, and Jason Seiden of Ajax Workforce. Uh, we will say goodbye today and see you next week. Bye, all.